Hi everybody, this is Mr. Folly. Everybody, minus Keebler, who's no longer with us. Um, welcome to Podcast 14.3. We're going to look at the pH of strong and weak acids and bases. Really, we're only going to look at the pH of strong ones um, and talk about how we don't know the weak ones yet. Um, and hydrides, we mentioned barely in the last podcast. Neutralization reactions and focusing on titration. So let's hop right into it. Strong acid. There are six strong acids, and you need to memorize all of them. They are HCl, HR, HI, HNO3, H2SO4, and HClO4. You should be able to name all of them. Nitric, sulfuric, perchloric, hydroiodic, hydrochloric, hydrobromic. You need to have those memorized. I could very well ask, name the six strong acids, and that could be your hydrogen, and that could be it. They ionize 100%, which means if you put them in water, if I have HNO3 plus H2O, I'm going to get H3O positive plus the nitrate ion all by itself. And this happens, this is not an equilibrium reaction, it's one way. Most of the time, acids um, are reversible, but strong acids do this 100% of the time. So this means the concentration of your strong acid or the molarity of your strong acid equals the molarity of your H positive or H3O positive. Every other acid besides these six strong ones are weak. They ionize less than 100%. Um, but that less than 100% is usually less than 5%. So what a weird way to designate things. So if I could say that you could be a strong chemistry student. If you're a strong chemistry student, you have a 100% in this class, okay? So if um, Sam had 100% in this class, you would be a strong chemistry student. Um, and Foucher has a 97% in this class, he is weak. So I would put him in the category of weak. Now, um, Sean Lenz could also be a weak chemistry student. He might have a 97, might have a 98, but we all know Sean Lenz has a 4% in chemistry. So he would be weak. So even though we would still call this an A+, plus, we would still call Sean Lenz an F-, minus. they would still be designated as weak. The only way he could be strong is to have 100% weak. Um, strong bases. The strong bases are group 1 and 2 hydroxides. So this is from the periodic table. So if you have your periodic table close to you, lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, these are group 1 all the way down to francium hydroxide. If you think hydrogen hydroxide is a strong one, there's something wrong with you. That's water. Okay. The strong bases would be the magnesium hydroxides. Notice this would be double hydroxy, the calcium hydroxides, etc. All of the group 2 hydroxides. They ionize 100%. That's the same rule. So the concentration of the base equals the concentration of the hydroxide. I'm going to put a little star next to that one. Um, if you have two OHs, it doubles the concentration of the OHs. So let's say I have 3.7 molar barium hydroxide. Because when barium hydroxide dissolves, it turns into barium plus 2 plus 2 hydroxides. Because I have a coefficient of 2 here, 3.7 would turn into 7.4, or 2 times 3.7. And that would be the concentration of hydroxide. The most common weak base is NH3. It's not the other hydroxides. You need to know that NH3 is a weak base, and it is called ammonia. Ammonium is NH4 positive, which you already have memorized. This is a weak base, ammonia. This is its conjugate acid, but we won't talk about it nearly as much. pH of the strong guys. So if I want to find the pH of the strong guys, if a substance is a strong acid or base, uh, the molarity of the acid equals H positive. The molarity of the base would be OH negative, a little star next to that one. So what is the pH of 0 0.0025 molar HCl solution? This is strong, so all I do is negative log 0 0.0025. Get out your friendly neighborhood calculator. Negative log 0 0.0025, and I get 2.60. If I'm doing calcium hydroxide, I label this one shinny. Notice how I have um, two hydroxides. So that means my hydroxide ion concentration is 0 0.00115 times 2, which is 0 0.00230. So negative log. 
2.00230 is log 2.00230 2.63. That. But what is this? This gives me, because it's hydroxide, that's my pOH. So if I want pH, I need to do 14 minus 2.63, which is 11.37. And there's my answer. What is the pH of 0.055 molar HNO2? HNO2 is weak. That's why it's a very shinny question. So we don't know. We can only do the strong ones. We'll do the weak ones next time. Titrations and neutralization. An acid plus a base, remember an acid and a base, they neutralize each other. Although we did learn that, uh, whoops, that lemons do not neutralize olives. We learned that didn't work. Almost all of the classes, I made somebody eat them both, and it still tasted just as bad. But you always get water and a salt. So let me show you how this works. HCl plus KOH yields... Now I want you to notice, there's, ooh, that's kind of big. There's my H and my OH, so that's where I get H2O plus, and what I have left over is KCl. I thought a salt was NaCl. No, salt is any ionic compound, and the way you know it's an ionic compound is it starts with a metal. Sulfuric acid, H2SO4 plus sodium hydroxide, NaOH. Maybe I should change to make this a lighter color. See my H, see my OH, that's where my water comes from. And then what's left is NaSO4. Oh, but wait, this is negative 2. This is plus 1, so it should be Na2SO4. Nitrous acid is HNO2, weak. Plus calcium hydroxide, CaOH taken twice. Oops, I think I forgot to balance this one. I did. So two of those and two of those. Um, nitrous acid hydroxide would give me H2O again. And CaNO2 taken twice. So two nitrites would be that. And two waters would be there. Titrations. Titrations uses this fancy piece of equipment. I'm going to change colors here. This fancy piece of equipment right here called a burette. A burette measures to the hundreds place. So that means, see how this says 20? It can really read to the 20.12 um, milliliters. And we use it because we want better measurements. And some people don't want to do that last estimation when we do this lab for real and they lose five points for not using it okay it would be like owning a Ferrari and not driving fast okay if you have a burette you have to do everything you can the burette can do if you have a Ferrari you have to drive it quickly the steps to prepare this reaction so what you're gonna do is you're gonna put something in the burette let's just say it can be anything but let's just say it's a base and down here in the beaker that would be your acid. So your acid, you would know the volume of it because you'd measure it ahead of time. And your base would be, you know, you'd know the uh, concentration of one and you'd know the volume of it. So you, you can figure out the volume of it and you know the concentration of only one of them. So to prepare your burette, this guy right here, you rinse the burette with whatever you're going to put it in there. So let's say we're going to put our base in our burette. Okay? So we put the base in our burette. We're going to rinse the burette with the substance, which would be the base that goes in it. Now, as soon as you load this thing up with water, this tip down here will still have air in it. In order to get the air out, because you want to make sure it's all the way out, you open up um, the stop cup completely. So what happens is this thing will let the fluid flow quickly through it and force out the bubbles. If you don't do that, it's bad news. Um, then you put in the acid that you want and the indicator. And the indicator will um, the indicator will change colors when you're done. And you're done at the equivalence point, which we'll hear about in a second. And really close to it. 
Um, and then you're going to record your initial volume of your burette. And you're going to add the burette until the color change, excuse me, changes, and then you're going to record the final volume. So you'll have an initial value which won't be zero. You have a final value which won't be zero, and then you subtract those two to get the volume. And you keep adding it until the color changes. So why does the color change? When asked if a certain pH is reached, we have indicators that change color at different pHs. Remember we did that YouTube video that showed all the colors and I talked about how you had different um, colors and how color really impacted the way people lived in the Renaissance. Um, and the change color at different points. We have an equivalence point, which is where equal amounts of H and OH, and the end point, which is where the color changes. Now, these two won't be exactly the same, but we want them to be very, very, very close, which isn't hard because there are lots of different indicators. But the indicator that we're going to use in um, for all of our titrations is phenolphthalein. It's easy to use, easy to find, difficult to spell with alien. How do we calculate the titration things? Because remember, um, one of the molarities is unknown. So equivalence is when the moles of H equal the moles of OH. And remember, the formula for molarity is molarity equals moles over liters. So, whoops, I did this kind of... So... Moles, if I rearrange for this, I could move liters up here. Moles equals mv. So if I want mv to equal mv, moles of acid would equal moles of base. And I put this x in here because that's the number of h's or oh's. So for example, if I have H2SO4, I would multiply my h side by 2. If I had um, ALOH taken three times, I would multiply my OH side by 3, because I have 3 OHs. And use this equation for titration calculations. If 25 milliliters of 0.25 molar sulfuric acid were titrated with 75 milli milliliters of sodium hydroxide base, what is the concentration of the base? So again, um, XMV equals XMV. And I tend to forget the end parts here. So so my multiplier would be 2. So 2 times the molarity of the acid, which is 0.25, times the volume, which is 25, equals sodium hydroxide is NaOH. So it has 1OH. So 1, which I'm not going to put, times M, which is my variable, 75 milliliters. Get out my handy-dandy little calculator. And I'm going to do 2 times... 0.25 times 25 divided by 75, and I get 0.167 molar. Okay. So 25B. If 25 milliliters hydrochloric acid were titrated with 35 milliliters of 3 molar MgOH taken twice, what is the concentration of the acid? So again, XMV equals XMV. Hydrochloric acid is HCl. So it only has one H, so I can ignore that part. Um, my volume of my acid is 25. The molarity of my acid is what I'm looking for. And then my X was 1. So looking at my base now, OH taken twice means I have a multiplier of 2. The molarity would be 3. The volume would be 35. So here we go. 2 times 3 times 35 divided by 25 is 8.4 HCl. And that's it. If 25 grams of ALOH taken three times were titrated with 24 milliliters of hydrochloric acid, what's the concentration of the HCl? Now, this is weird because it's grams, and I want to use XMV equals XMV. But all I have, as far as my regular variables, is 24 for the volume of my acid. Now, going back earlier, we know that mv equals moles. So what I'm going to do is figure out this thing right here uh, for aluminum hydroxide. Now, notice hydroxide is going to have the x value of 3. 
So I do know that this is going to be hydrochloric acid, right? I'll do my acid on the left, and that's going to be a 1. The molarity is what I'm looking for, and the volume of my acid is 24, equals the x value for my base is 3. MV is moles, so I'm just going to figure out how many moles 25 grams is. ALOH taken three times. Going retro on you. Grams of ALOH. Well, taken three times. Well, that's hard to read, but you should know what it is. You know what? Maybe you don't. ALOH taken three times. And one mole. ALOH taken three times. I'm going to go to the periodic table for little g stands for grams, little g stands for go to the periodic table. 26.98 is aluminum plus um, hydroxyoxygen 16, hydrogen 1.01, .01, so 17.01 .01 quantity times 3. I got 78.01. 5 divided by that answer is 0.32. So that would be 0.320 moles of aluminum hydroxide. So instead of MV here, I'm going to do 0 0.320. So I took this and I changed it into moles. And I'm going to solve for the molarity. So 3 times 0 0.32 divided by 24 divided by 1. My molarity is 0 0.04 molar HCl. That's it. And iodides. Anhydrous means without water. If something is an anhydrate means it's without water. Metal oxides are base anhydrides. So to give you an idea of this, Na2O plus H2O gives you NaOH plus, oh, that's it, gives you NaOH, 2NaOH. All right? So that's it. Metal oxide plus water gives you a base. Non-metal oxide plus water is an acid anhydride. So SO2, this is a, by the way, not that it matters that much, but it will matter in a minute. SO2 gas, metal oxides are always solids. That's good to know. Non-metal oxides are always gases. SO2 plus H2O gives you H2SO3. So you just kind of smush them together and reduce. So if I wrote this as HOH, and Na2O, um, what happens is you have Na, two Na's, right? So you're one of my Na's is going to get this OH, and the other Na is going to get this O and this H. And that's where that comes from. And this is O3. Um, acids and bases always should be aqueous, just so you know. This is the reaction that we talked about um, last podcast about acid rain. Now, this becomes acid rain because SO2 is a gas, so it floats up into the clouds, reacts with water and clouds, rains down. So why can't I use a base anhydride to fix acid rain? This guy is a solid, so what I would have to do is take my rock of base, chuck it up into the clouds, and hope there's enough water to make it work. Well, we're not going to like have a bunch of people standing there throwing rocks up in the air. And that's about it. Um, this one's going a little long, so sugar and base injuries. Come on. Don't mess with acids or bases or Texas. Um, that's what happens to your eye. You get acid in it. So what happens to your finger. Finger. This is a base injury. This right here is a big cow. Don't mess with Texas. This is Longhorn. Um, review. Blah, 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 blah. I want to get out of here in less than 20 minutes. Um, read this stuff. You should know phenylphthalein. Um, that's it. Have a good one. Sorry it's so long, but you know what? It's a lot of good information.